Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today. We uh, have over 300 people registered, and it's no wonder um, for this extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. Um, we actually are turning a page right now in history and in, in the history of the Middle East. Um, we know that throughout the electoral campaign, um, President Joe Biden had promised that he was going to go back to the JCPOA or the 2015 nuclear deal, or as Tony Blinken had said, he was going to make the deal longer and stronger. Um, we know um, also Tony Blinken had said that the Iranians are weeks away from nuclear breakout when they have enough highly enriched uranium um, to use for um, nuclear activities. Um, and um, the Israelis say that they are months away and that it's just, um, but with, with their attaching it to a missile um, and putting it on a missile head, it will probably be one to two years. But in the six years, um, that have transpired since Hezbollah, uh, I mean, since Iran um, had been in, um, involved in the nuclear talks with the P5 plus one countries. Um, they have made a great deal of progress and um, they've also made a great deal of progress in um, developing their Iranian proxy networks. I'm sure you've all heard by now about the land bridge that that um, stretches from Tehran um, to um, Baghdad, to um, Damascus, to Beirut, and all the way to the Mediterranean. And they have been um, replicating this Hezbollah network throughout the world. Um, and we are in extremely capable hands um, to be able to discuss this with um, Steve Emerson. Steve Emerson is um, extremely well renowned. He is an American investigative journalist um, and a national security and terrorism expert. Um, he is, um, went to Brown University um, and he, um, of course, um, he got his master's at Brown um, and he had been a freelance writer for the New Republic and um, for U.S. News and World Report. He was a senior editor, and then um, he had worked for CNN in 1990. And um, in um, 1993, um, he left CNN in order to work on a, a groundbreaking documentary, um, Terrorists Among Us, Jihad in America. Um, in that documentary, he warned of the future of Islamic terrorism, and this, of course, was eight years before September 11th, 2001. And he had warned about a future Islamic terrorist attack on the United States. Um, so we are extremely privileged today to be able to hear from this wonderful expert and dear, dear friend of mine and of Amit's, um, Steve Emerson. Okay, Steve, take it away. Hi, Sarah. You just committed a 10 perjuries, so we'll, we'll, we'll be very light on you when you get your indictment, but uh, thank, <laughs> you. thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know, uh, pleasure to be with Emmett. Uh, Sarah's done a phenomenal job, really. Uh, a, a one man, one woman IDF. Let me, I think there's an echo here. Hold on one second. Um, a one woman IDF. Uh, as, as well as a U.S. Army combined special forces. She's done a phenomenal job, really has. Uh, and uh, so all of you who are in, involved, great. And if not, you should get involved. Um, um, so my comments today, um, I operate an organization called the Investigative Project on Terrorism. It's now in its 26th year. And if any of you uh, want to take over, please volunteer. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, at the end, I'll let you, uh, if you want to get our newsletter, we, we, have, uh, we send out emails of uh, investigations that we do all the time. Our focus is on radical Islam, 
but the spectrum is on counterterrorism, ranging in from Israel to uh, Islamic countries. But we also, our mission is to promote uh, moderate Islam, reformed Islam. Um, and so we, we have a wide, wide spectrum of stories. Um, and uh, our specialty is to do investigations that no, the media doesn't do. And of course, uh, we also follow the media, uh, especially their bra brazen, if you hear sirens in the background, it's not for me, it's just <laughs> down the street. Um, the, the media's brazen dishonesty. Uh, this most recent case was the uh, New York Times systematic attack on uh, Prime Minister Macron of France when he uh, issued his uh, very uh, courageous speech and policy toward trying to integrate Muslims in France who would not integrate. Um, and he, he, he railed against uh, Islamic separatism and also against the whole issue of radical Islam. This was after a series of brutal terrorist attacks, including the beheading of, of a teacher, just because uh, you know, he showed, uh, the teacher showed cartoons uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, were considered blasphemy. In any case, uh, uh, considering that he has the highest, Macron has the highest percentage of, uh, of Muslims in Europe, uh, and, and has borne the brunt of more terrorist attacks per capita than any other country. Um, he was attacked by the New York Times, not just editorially, but by the reporters who blamed him for Islamophobia, for overreacting, for, is, for blaming, it was blaming the victim. And so we came to his defense and uh, I, I didn't think I would, but uh, he, he really deserved a lot of credit for what he has done. Uh, he stood his ground. Uh, it's the first time the French have ever done that. They were notorious in the 80s for cutting deals with terrorists. Uh, and they acknowledged that uh, recently. But he, he is, he's an unusual man, uh, a leader for doing this. Other leaders uh, have issued reports. For example, David Cameron issued reports about the Muslim Brotherhood taking over all the Islamic groups in Britain. Uh, didn't do anything about it. Uh, Merkel's uh, uh, federal agencies issued reports about radical Islam and Hezbollah being very active in all of the different provinces, didn't do anything about it, uh, but Macron did, so give him credit. So the topic today is about Hezbollah, and you should be seeing a map, uh, I'm assuming, in front of you. Uh, it's a worldwide map, and you either have the flag of Hezbollah or the flag of uh, Iran. Um, what it connotes are the there are three aspects of their uh, positions. Either they operate in these countries, or they have launched attacks in these countries, uh, or somehow uh, they are connected in, in one way or another. So, for example, if we were to zoom in on uh, the Middle East, which is here. Um, so let me uh, let me back out. Let me zoom in here. Uh, 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 okay, I zoomed out. To you, you have to bear with me with my technical deficiencies. Um, Jason, can we zoom in here on on the on the Middle East here? What we see here, it's very clustered here. But the fact is that Iran and and Hezbollah, yes, perfect. They, they are um, saturated everywhere from Turkey uh, to Syria to Iraq to Lebanon, uh, Jordan, Israel, uh, 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 Egypt to a lesser extent, the West Bank, Gaza. And when I say saturated, um, what I mean is that their operational terrorist activities or this Turkey trains them, provides... Uh, financing. Iran, of course, provides weapons and financing. Um, and the situation today is a powder keg. As you all know, uh, Lebanon today has uh, one of the, probably the largest number of long-range missiles uh, in the world uh, that 
um, per, uh, in fact, they, they have a, a, a base of long range Scud missiles with accurate GPS systems that can actually hit every square inch of Israel within a radius of uh, five meters, uh, which means that if there was a war, uh, and, and unfortunately, but the Israeli generals say it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, um, those 120 or 130,000 missiles, of which they don't know for sure, but maybe up to 30, 40,000 are equipped with these extremely accurate GPS systems. They can take out the Israeli Demona reactor. They can take out the gas facilities in Haifa. They can take out the natural gas facilities off the coast of the Mediterranean. They can take out every single Israeli air base, army base. It's, it's a catastrophic scenario um, that is that Israel is training for. And if you note that in the last three days, Israel has done some extremely uh, uh, very sophisticated tra Air Force training in which they've simulated bombing up to 3,000 targets a day, which is absolutely unparalleled because in the last Lebanese war, they were only able to take out 120 targets a day. If there is a war with Hezbollah, you can be sure that they would be uh, launching at least 1,000 to 2,000 rockets a day. It will be a very bloody war. And I don't want to scare everybody because Hezbollah is also deterred by the fact that there is a, a real animus in Lebanon by the Sunnis, by the Christians, uh, uh, even by 30% uh, of the Shiites, uh, as far as we can tell, uh, against Hezbollah. They've corrupted the whole country. They're seen as thugs. The only thing that keeps them there is the fact that they're there and nobody can re uh, can uh, remove them. But uh, the, the option is a civil war. And I can tell you when I was doing research last summer about who was responsible for the explosion at the port of Beirut, and, and there's no doubt that, that uh, Hezbollah was responsible because they, they own the ammonium nitrate that was in the uh, warehouse and they own the, also the, there were nine warehouses. One of them was the ammonium nitrate, which was about 8,000 pounds. And then there was another warehouse full of weapons uh, uh, next, uh, right adjacent to it. And they controlled the, uh, the actual port. So uh, they're totally responsible. The question is whether they did it deliberately or not. There's no answer to that at this point, but they refuse to take any responsibility. The, 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 the actual uh, uh, casualties were borne most, mostly by the Christians because the Christian quarter was devastated uh, and there wasn't any money to repair it because no in financial in international institutions are going to come into uh, Lebanon right now with its corruption, with Hezbollah in control of the army. Um, and so the, the poor Lebanese people that really have suffered tremendously, 85% of the, of the Lebanese pound has been devalued. Hezbollah is the only one that's been able to deal in dollars. You cannot uh, withdraw dollars from a Lebanese ATM. Uh, the only thing I will add right now is we're gonna be coming out with a story uh, in the next week or so, which will be pretty, uh, interesting and devastating to Hezbollah. Uh, it concerns uh, Hezbollah's banking system, which is corrupt. But um, the only thing I'll say is it has to do with the, fa with the assassination of a uh, Hezbollah critic uh, who was assassinated last week. Uh, uh, his name was uh, Slim Lockman. He operated an anti, he was a Shiite who operated an anti Hezbollah center in Beirut, uh, which was very, very courageous. And he was facilitating a defection of somebody from the Hezbollah bank. Um, and uh, he was shot, he was found shot to death. Of course, you know, you know, nobody claimed responsibility. And of course, the media didn't blame Hezbollah, but they were definitely at fault. Having said all that, I'm going to move on to other countries. Uh, Turkey is a major player 
in the recruitment of Palestinians go abroad to Turkey. Um, his, Turkey's also offered uh, total uh, free asylum to major killers of Americans. The Taylor Force Act should apply to uh, Turkey, absolutely. The killers, the, uh, the organizers of the killers of the three young 14-year-olds uh, was seven years ago, uh, uh, Salah Aruri got uh, free hotel status in Turkey. Um, and uh, Turkey now also last year uh, was providing fake passports for Hamas operatives to travel uh, not just back into Gaza through Egypt, uh, where they don't do very accurate checking, but also to Europe, where they could do more damage in terms of fundraising. Um, that, that was Hamas. Um, his, ha Hamas, by the way, it has to be said, doesn't target American interests worldwide. Hezbollah, on the other hand, as you can see here in this map, absolutely has the most active, comprehensive, worldwide criminal enterprise uh, that's ever, it's, it, it exceeds any type of car narcotics cartel that you could ever imagine. It is involved in any aspect of illegal money making you can imagine. From counterfeit, it is the largest and chief uh, uh, producer of counterfeit goods in the world, as well as narcotics trafficking, it's involved in uh, human trafficking, and its range extends, uh, with, let's take a larger view here uh, of the world. You can see that it, it extends from um, throughout Africa, um, and, and, and this has gone on for years. Um, it goes into uh, Asia, uh, it goes in um, Thailand, Unfortunately, uh, you know, did the same thing the French did. There was a terrorist, uh, they arrested two Hezbollah terrorists uh, two years ago uh, uh, with, with actual weapons, uh, just as they were planning to attack in the Israeli embassy. And uh, in, in about uh, uh, eight months later, before the trial, they were let go by Thailand, ostensibly, to free an American hostage someplace else, but it was really because Thailand didn't want to suffer the consequences of uh, the potential Hezbollah, you know, uh, put the, you know, counterattack. And Hezbollah will threaten any country that that uh, locks up its people, as does Iran. But their bark is much worse than their bite. Okay, um, and it's really necessary. Why are we getting Finland in here? Uh, can you remove that? Let's see here. Um, <laughs> sorry, get rid of these countries. Um, um, I don't know why these. I'm trying to get rid of this here. Um, so, uh, what happened here? Jason, are you aware? <laughs> these things. These things. I, I'm not doing recipes today, I can assure you. <laughs> Jason, are you. Jason, are you aware of what's going on here? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay. I'm very happy when, I, when I'm surrounded by Hezbollah and Iran. Okay, in, 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 uh, in, in, in uh, South America, that has been historically the place where they have been operating uh, for more than 35 years. Uh, they're first operation was the 1992 bombing of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires. They blew it, enti they just blew it up. It, they destroyed it entirely. 34 people were killed, all uh, Israeli embassy employees. That was 1992. In 1994, in Buenos Aires, they blew up the uh, Amia building. Uh, 98 people were killed. I remember going down there. Um, we don't need this. Uh, and um, that started a phenomenally uh, outrageous uh, effort by the Argentinian government to cover up the fact that they knew who the eight uh, suspects were for which arrest warrants were issued, eight Iranians operating in the tri-border area. Um, 
And the fact is that um, nothing was ever done, as you all probably know. Uh, they went through probably nine prosecutors until uh, one of them finally was compiling a major report, Alberto Niesman, and um, uh, 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 who was a Jewish uh, prosecutor. And this was, I think, about uh, three years ago. The day before he was supposed to issue his report, he was found shot to death with one bullet to his head. Questions around uh, arose about whether he committed suicide or was shot to death. And uh, it was determined by the autopsy that he was murdered. Uh, his murder was not solved. And then only about three months ago, a guy named Tel Shadin, who was in prison for driving the van that went, that blew up the Ame building, was suddenly released from jail. So the, the Argentinians have never dealt straight on this. Um, and it's really something that um, should have been um, dealt with by Washington in, in throughout the seven administrations since 94, six administrations, and nobody has done that. The tri-border area, which is that area that's, uh, which is basically uh, uh, totally without any type, Paraguay, uh, Uruguay, uh, Venezuela, w without any type of border controls, is a known Hezbollah uh, vacation spot. I'm, I'm kidding. It's it's where they they operate with total impunity. Now, Venezuela in the last uh, since uh, Chavez, he invited them in to uh, into uh, uh, Venezuela. They began operating bases there, uh, and from there they moved into. Oh, I should say, Panama is also a place where Hezbollah has operated. Uh, the day after the Amiya building, I think it was July 24th, uh, 1994, uh, it was July 25th, the, uh, a plane coming out of Panamanian uh, airport with 25 people blew up, never was solved. The only uh, un remaining un unidentified suspect was somebody whose limbs were, were not, it was, it was a suicide bomber. Just uh, two months ago, the U.S., released a wanted a dead or alive of a Hezbollah suspect. This is uh, an unusual fact that it took 26 uh, years for them to issue a wanted dead or alive for a suspect who may not be alive. But Hezbollah is very, was and has been very active there. And in Mexico, uh, in Mexico, uh, Hezbollah has been known to operate several villages on the East Coast, including one where they actually have done dug tunnels, practice tunnels in preparation uh, for their tunnels that they built across Gaza. Um, and according to officials who monitor the traffic of illegal immigrants, um, and um, over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I know the Texas uh, DHS and they were in charge, they got intelligence reports of people picked up at the border. Uh, they, they were never um, identified. Um, they, were, um, they were called OTMs. And I at first thought, what are they talking about, OTMs? Uh, I've heard of ATMs, but they were, uh, OTMs stand for other than, other than uh, 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 Americans, whatever. And they, other, and so other than Mexicans. And so th they picked up, uh, hundreds of uh, uh, Iranians and uh, Middle Easterners, of which it has never been fully released for reasons that I am not aware of, other than the fact that it was embarrassing, um, of which they can, they can actually prove the intentions of at least scores of them were terrorists. Just the other day, uh, 13... Iranians were just picked up uh, crossing the border, and they actually illegally got into uh, Arizona, and they were, they were picked up 50 miles into Arizona. I don't know what was their intention. In the U.S., uh, you see only one uh, icon, but the U.S. has been a major base for operations for the Iranians and Hezbollah, from everything from weapons procurement to uh, 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 to uh, 
collection of intelligence on uh, Israeli and Jewish targets, the uh, uh, to collection of to narcotics trafficking, to um, operating uh, uh, um, illegal um, um, money laundering operations. For example, major operation was shipping it cars without their VINs, uh, wiping out their VINs, shipping them illegally to Ghana. This went on for years, and Ghana would sell them back to Hezbollah with a 20% discount markup so that Hezbollah would make money. This was an operation that was run, uh, that was monitored by the DEA called Operation Cassandra. Now, it, it, it became public because uh, the LA Times which usually, uh, political, which usually doesn't do great stories, did a great story a couple of years ago showing that the Obama administration actually stopped Operation Cassandra, which was monitoring all of the criminal activities by Hezbollah. And remember, anybody who is, belongs to Hezbollah who does a criminal activity is can be recruited to do a terrorist activity. And they range from South Florida, which traditionally has been Hezbollah's base, to Texas, uh, to New York, where only uh, last year, three Iranians were arrested for suspicion of plotting to bomb Jewish targets. They couldn't prove it uh, because they arrested them before they had the chance to actually uh, uh, procure the, uh, the uh, ex explosives. But speaking of explosives, just so you know, if you look at the world map, uh, Jason, if you can pull that up, um, that ammonium nitrate that was found in the in the uh, port of Beirut, you should know that um, thousands of pounds of ammonium nitrate had been smuggled into Cyprus, into Britain, into Spain, um, uh, and um, and into um, um, uh, Austria. Uh, through the Iranian diplomatic pouch. That's a big pouch to, to, to smuggle in a thousand pounds. So it, it's, it's not your traditional pouch. You know, the, the Iranians really abused it and they got away with it. Uh, if these uh, explosives had been used in bombs and they were intended, they would have killed thousands. Uh, the last uh, uh, trial that was uh, held of Iranians was the Iranian attache uh, in, uh, in Belgium uh, who smuggled in explosives through Austria uh, to two Belgium Iranian uh, Belgium slash Iranian nationals who were going to blow, blow up uh, the MEK uh, rally held a couple of years ago uh, in France with Giuliani and the head of the MEK uh, and it was uh, through Israeli intelligence that they arrested them and they were just convicted just three weeks ago. Uh, big fear that they were gonna be uh, either expelled or you know, given uh, a free trip back home, but they weren't. Uh, because in many cases, the Iranians operate like John Gotti, you know, put me away and I'm gonna kill you. Uh, you know, in fact, it's, the John Gotti philosophy is basically what they're doing now with the US. They're being very aggressive, um, exceptionally aggressive now in, in threatening Israel, uh, in unleashing the Houthis. The day after the Houthi designation was removed as terrorists, the Houthis shot a uh, air-to-air air air missile at a Saudi plane in, uh, uh, in, in a Saudi airport. Um, they are exceptionally active now in Syria, building up a village actually in Quenetra, that's another front on Israel. And they are very active in Iraq. Uh, they just unleashed a uh, Hezbollah uh, Iranian militia that just killed an American serviceman. It remains to be seen whether the Biden administration is gonna react. So their philosophy is, if you don't do a deal with us, we'll kill you. That's, that's the mafia's rule. You know, no, no, no real difference actually, except Iran's a state. Um, or claims to be one. Um, so there you have it. You know, it, there, there are several reports on our website that we have about their activities. 
um, it's 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 probably the, the Iranian uh, Hezbollah nexus uh, is probably the the most comprehensive terrorist criminal enterprise nexus that has ever been developed in the world today, and they continue to do so uh, because countries are are not run, are run by corruption uh, in Africa, in Latin America. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, and officials get bought off. Um, but um, the, the Israelis have been, have been very good at picking up the Hezbollah and Iranian trained operatives in the West Bank, in Israel, um, uh, and, and even those that are going to Gaza. They, they just confiscated uh, $5 million in cash uh, of uh, uh, Iranian money going into uh, into Gaza, um, and they just picked up in the last uh, month uh, three uh, his, uh, Iranian uh, Palestinians who were trained by Iran in Turkey um, to carry out terrorism in Israel. So the the Israeli uh, Secret Service uh, Shin Bet is 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 very good. But again, you've heard the that axiom that. Uh, they only have to succeed once. Uh, we, uh, the good guys, have to succeed 100% of the time, which is not going to happen, unfortunately. As in Bulgaria, uh, five years ago, when Hezbollah uh, put a bomb on a tourist bus deliberately against the Israelis and killed five Israeli citizens. Um, so that's going to happen. Um, as far as the last thing I'll say is, the, the only question that you know, we haven't seen remains to be proven is whether this cross fertilization between Hezbollah, Iran, and let's say ISIS um, uh, uh, and other and Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, th there's no doubt that Al Qaeda has a relationship with Iran uh, in terms of providing uh, asylum, uh, providing uh, even weapons. Whether they have tactically shared operational attempts to attack Americans overseas, that has not been proven. Um, the, the, but, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen if Al-Qaeda wants to branch out, because Iran has the weapons, has the contacts, has the criminal enterprise. And remember, that criminal enterprise can be transitioned to a terrorist enterprise with the, with the switch of a light bulb. Uh, that's very unusual for any country to have that ability. So um, it's, but we, we still haven't seen that cross fertilization, though that's not necessary for Iran to carry up massive terrorist attacks. Um, the deterrent is, of course, sanctions, uh, although we know the world is, is very weak in terms of doing that, except the Trump administration really did weaken their ability uh, to, uh, their, they devalued their currency tremendously. They stopped their uh, payments to Hezbollah by as much as 80% over the last four years. Tremendous drop of money to Hezbollah. Um, they, but they did provide uh, uh, a, uh, somehow uh, an increase of long range rockets to Hamas. Uh, which uh, sort of confounded everybody because nobody figured out how they did that. Uh, they smuggled them in somehow so that Hamas's rockets now are not just the short-range rockets that can reach uh, Steyrut. They're the long-range rockets that can reach uh, uh, Tel Aviv and northern suburbs with pretty devastating consequences and can override the Iron Dome system if launched within a certain frequency. The Iron Dome is meant to take out maybe 30 or 40 in a sequence, but if they're launched within 100 at a time, they can override that. Um, I don't mean to give you bad news, but, but the technology always has to catch up uh, to the bad guys. That's always the way it works. All right, I think I've spoken enough. Uh, open up the questions. Okay, on that sanguine moment, um, 
I, okay, I'm going to take the liberty as the moderator to ask the first two questions. Um, the first one has to do with what you mentioned going on in Lebanon, where Hezbollah basically is um, in, in control of um, any commercial enterprise and of the military. And I know that after the 2006 war in Lebanon between Israel and Hezbollah, um, there was UN Security Council 1701 that said that the LAF basically has got to um, make sure that they rid themselves of any foreign influence. Well, unfortunately, as you said right now, um, Hezbollah is the dominant force within the LAF, yet um, America has been giving um, I know it's been $1.8 billion to the LAF over the last 10 years in order for them to act as some sort of buffer against Hezbollah. Um, do you have any recommendations, Steve, about this money that we're giving to the LAF? Well, I, it, it, you raise a very good point. I, I remember last summer when I was doing an investigation of the Port of Beirut and I spoke to the uh, to several Lebanese generals, two four stars who were Sunni generals who despised Hezbollah. But when I brought up, it's interesting, there's no doubt, first of all, what you said is absolutely accurate, that Hezbollah is not just part of the government, but they dominate the military and they have access to the weapons. And there's absolutely, um, um, th th there is absolutely, a, um, a a military uh, 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 sc scandal for supplying the Lebanese military with, with one penny or, or with, with, with one, uh, you know, hand grenade, given the fact that Hezbollah has got access to everything. Now, but, but it's a little complicated. Now, I, I have argued and I, I gotten into an argument with the Assistant Secretary of State last summer, um, who everybody knows who he is. He's, he used to work for us. Um, and um, and I, um, I was pretty emphatic, uh, but it didn't make a difference. He didn't make the, he didn't make the policy. I'll, I will say that. I don't know who made the policy, but the fact is, it was sort of an inherited policy and nobody was willing to cut it off. Um, even though Congress had expressed its will, uh, made, made many protests about the fact and, and, and had many and had hearings about the fact the Lebanese military was thoroughly dominated, infiltrated by Hezbollah. Um, but when I spoke to generals, Sunni generals, one, two of them were four stars, one was the head of, the, uh, of intelligence. Um, when I spoke to them about the port of Beirut, they blamed Hezbollah. They were disgusted with Hezbollah. They wanted them out. They were ready to actually uh, engage in a civil war. And just, they even asked if, you know, and I wasn't calling on behalf of the U.S. government, although they, they sort of assumed I was. They asked whether I could arrange for weapons. And I said, look, guys, I'm not the U.S. government. But that's the extent to which they were so willing to, to, to engage in a civil war to get rid of Hezbollah. So there is that, that incredible anger at Hezbollah and a desire to get rid of them and engage, you know, if they had the weapons, they would. Now, when I brought up the Lebanese army, that was a sore point with them because they're, they're proud Lebanese generals. And so when I said, you know, the Lebanese army is infiltrated by Hezbollah and the U.S. is, you know, you know, when I brought up the issue of stopping weapon, uh, uh, you know, transfers, they got defensive, of course, because the Lebanese army is their, is their baby. Um, but again, Sarah, you raise a very good point. Uh, the, but I, I will say this, though, the, the, the Hezbollah uh, arsenal, the separate Hezbollah arsenal, is a hundred times greater than the than the Lebanese military arsenal. So even if you shut even if you shut that down, the problem is that the independent arsenal is so great. And the question is, who is going to fight them? And I know that, I tell you the 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 outrage and the frustration with Shiites 
uh, against Hezbollah for the first time is, is you know, has sort of reached a, criti a, a critical point that, a, that if they had the weapons, <clears throat> they would engage in a civil war. But the problem is, <clears throat> given our <clears throat> foreign policy that existed, it was sort of a, an isolationist foreign policy and nobody wanted to engage in another war. And I don't think this one, this new administration does either. Um, and, and Hezbollah will not leave on its own accord. And that's the problem. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's really going to, I mean, if I, if I had to guess, the only way Hezbollah is going to leave is, you know, um, you know, feed first. Um, and um, that's going to be left up to the Israelis. All right, I'm not going to dominate. I have other questions for you, but um, we've had uh, our board is is lit up with questions. So I am going to turn it over to our lovely director of communications, Sarah Leah Thompson, who will read the questions that have come in. Sarah Leah. Yep. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Steve, for joining us today. Uh, we, as usual, have gotten a lot of questions. We won't be able to get through all of them, unfortunately, but we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, so the first question we have. What is US and the US and Israeli intelligence doing to counter Hezbollah and Iran's terrorist activities? <laughs> That's I'm sorry, but I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Uh, <laughs> look, um, well, there's, look, I'm not gonna say anything that, that I shouldn't say. So let's just say this, there, there, there's no doubt. Uh, just the other day, uh, uh, just yesterday, actually, uh, a, a Pentagon intelligence official revealed the fact that uh, Ethiopia had stopped a major attack against the United Arab Emirates and a, a mission uh, consulate and embassy, as well as the Sudanese embassy in Ethiopia for the Sudan. Um, so the, there's no doubt uh, the Israeli intelligence is uh, dedicated uh, to the maximum. Uh, and they have phenomenal resources, but let's just say you know, what they don't know, they don't know. And, and that's why terrorism, you know, so that whenever a terrorist attack occurs in Israel, it's because it slips through the cracks because you can't stop every single one. But, but they have, you know, it's like the FBI. The, the FBI has batted about 95% on more than 125 attempted Islamist terrorist plots since 9-11. But the ones that they haven't succeeded in stopping were Nidal Hassan, uh, with San Bernardino, the Orlando Pulse Club, uh, Fort Lauderdale and others. And so um, that, that's the problem. Their, their intelligence is only, you know, it, it, it's, not per, it's not a perfect, op, it's not a perfect uh, science. It's, it depends you know, on uh, the ability to track these people. And if there are new people involved and they use new detection systems to counter uh, the technology, then they can get away with it. Uh, but the Israelis have been absolutely phenomenal, the best in the world in not only stopping Hezbollah and Iranian attacks against them, but in warning other countries. I believe they, issued a report last year, the year before, uh, in which they actually had stopped more than 40 attacks against European and other countries by Hezbollah and Iran. So they've done a really good job, but again, there's no perfect defense against them. Thank you. Uh, our next question. Since the US and China seem to be standing with Israel's enemies, is there any hope that those countries participating in the Abraham Accords and others like them can create a group substantive enough to get through the current reversal in US policy toward Israel, in your opinion? Um, let, let, me, let me try to understand what, what, if you can try to break that, maybe break that in half since I'm not really following the Yeah, um, I think the, the intent of the question is whether or not the, the recent com countries that um, Israel has entered into peace treaties with the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Sudanese, the Moroccans, and others that might 
have uh, under the table relations with Israel like Saudi Arabia, whether they can um, work together as a unit to help block the Iranian, Iranian plans. Well, they, they certainly are doing phenomenal work in terms of intelligence sharing. Um, get, even the Saudis uh, have been engaged in intelligence sharing with the Israelis for years now, even though there's no diplomatic uh, relationship, and there probably won't be for a bit of time now. Um, so yes, they, they've done a phenomenal job. Um, but um, again, um, UAE, UAE is, in a, is in an interesting relationship. I, I didn't realize this, but UAE's, half of UAE's export and imports are with Iran because it's such, such a close country. And so, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, product, it, you know, it's uh, produce uh, and all that, $2 billion worth. So uh, Iran actually has a deterrent internal deterrent into not trying to attack UAE directly on its soil um, because it wouldn't want to interrupt its commercial relationship. And probably UAE, um, you know, you know is, is really, so UAE is actually, nobody really wants to talk about it, but UAE is probably busting some of those sanctions. Um, hopefully Israel um, can start actually fulfilling that vacuum in terms of uh, produce and other manufactured materials for the UAE market. Um, now, as far as a, uh, a joint union, there already is, but the question is how, um, how strong, they're, they're, they're only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, Bahrain is, is a weak link not because of their intent, but remember Bahrain is a Shiite country. And so the population is very vulnerable to uh, anti-Israeli sentiment and to a potential attack. And if I had to guess, that would be the place where there would be the next, uh, a, 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 an attack planted by Iran. So uh, yes, the, the questioner has the right intent in saying what can be done, but there's a limit to what they can do. Great, thank you. Uh, for our next question, why does Iran use Hezbollah for some of their foreign operations and not rely entirely on their in-house IRGC? Well, good question. Um, first of all, Iran has more than, uh, IRGC actually doesn't carry out external activities. Uh, that, that, that's their revolutionary guards. Um, they, they may go on expeditions, let's say, to Syria to fight for, for Bashar al-Assad, but otherwise uh, they're, they're the home guard. Um, the, the Iranians have proxies. They have uh, numerous proxies, many more than just Hezbollah, by the way. Uh, there's the Islamic Jihad organization, which is different than the Islamic Jihad in Gaza, by the way. Um, they have militias, by the way, uh, that extend through in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, probably about a dozen militias in Iraq, all funded by Iran. Um, why do they do that? Well, uh, you know, the same way, you know, uh, you've heard the term plausible deniability. Um, well, you know, it, it's a way, for one, for them to use locals in those countries to carry out operations that the Iranians couldn't easily do as foreigners. Um, so locals integrate very easily because they're residents. Um, so they um, usually, when you see operations, you'll see them using residents of local countries. Even if they're Iranian born, you'll see Iranian Americans being co-opted to carry out, let's say, surveillance of uh, a restaurant in DC, it happened about six years ago, of the Saudi ambassador eating and they plan to blow it up. Uh, and th so they'll use residents of local countries, even if they're Iranian extraction, because they have the legal basis for being there. Great, thank you. We have time for a few more questions. The next is, will the people that Biden has put into the intelligence community and State Department make sharing intelligence more difficult due to trust issues between our Middle East allies and America? 
That's a very good question. Um, you know, um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, intelligence sharing actually changes with administrations, uh, um, and it, it it change, and it also depends also on the policies of the president, depending upon what he decides to allow, let's say, the intelligence community to share. Now, there's always going to be a basis of permanent intelligence sharing, let's say, with Israel and the Pentagon, and permanent intelligence sharing between Israel, let's say, and the, uh, the CIA. But that's not going to change. The question is, how much more above the regular intelligence sharing, existential uh, um, intelligence sharing that is, will always, it will go both ways, no doubt, no matter what administration. But um, sometimes when you have a CIA director who's hostile to Israel um, or a DNI director who supports BDS as we have now, um, who's in charge of 21 different agencies, um, I can say that there's a political dimension to how far they'll go beyond the rudimentary level of intelligence sharing. And, and I don't know what the answer is. It, it really depends upon uh, the, the political types. And that goes from the president and the vice president and the national security advisor and the secretary of state. Great, thank you. For our next question, can you please discuss Iranian develop, uh, in, sorry, involvement in the Far East and Australia? Um, good question. Um, it, I, Iran, um, there's no, uh, I left out Australia by mistake because Iran definitely has tried to infiltrate and develop a base of operations in Australia, not with great success, but with some success. Uh, but they have yet to carry out a, a, a major attack there. But the, the Australians know that Iran wants to establish, there's an Iranian community in Australia. Uh, and, and, and I want to be sure that nobody you know, says that all Iranians, wherever they are, are terrorists. That's far from it. And remember that the, in the United States, most of the Iranian community here, for example, in LA, are all ex, you know, dissidents and expatriates who left uh, before the uh, revolution. And they are the most patriotic Americans possible. So I want to put that to rest. It's, it's not all Iranians. It's only certain types who are put here on the basis of being, let's say, a sleeper agent. Same thing in Australia. Now, in the Far East, Thailand, again, has been the, uh, uh, an operational base for Hezbollah. Um, in Thailand, unfortunately, after they arrested two terrorists, who try to blow up the Israeli embassy, uh, you know, let them go. Uh, that only, you know, emboldened Iran, uh, which is his beloved patron. Um, so yes, look, Iran and his Iran and Hezbollah will seek any place in the world that has an opportunity to either provide um, a source of funding or an operational base from which they can attack either an Israeli target or a Jewish target. So if they can use Australia to hit a Jewish target, they will. If they can use Thailand to hit an Israeli embassy, they will. If they can use Turkey to train, to come back to Israel or to hit uh, or to go to Bulgaria, they will. So uh, they, 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 are, they have units, um, special units that are, that intelligence units, that their only mission is to seek out geographical locations for uh, would-be uh, surveillance uh, or for sleeper cells to collect intelligence for potential future attacks and then to activate those sleeper cells. That's the real problem because you have innocent Iranians who, who then get co-opted by the government for a variety of reasons and they end up becoming terrorists. Um, and some, some of them against their will because uh, the Iranian regime uses their family back home as hostages. 
Uh, others do it because they're ideologically committed to the regime, but uh, they have tremendous resources to do this. Uh, even though the the maximum pressure campaign by the Trump administration really robbed them of a tremendous amount of money, to the extent that the economy shrank in Iran by seven percent per year, their uh, their budget shrank by uh, fourteen percent per year in some years. Uh, their uh, the inflation was rampant. Um, and they had to drop their subsidies to their proxies, uh, but still, um, you know, and they tried to do, you know, as you know, uh, illegal uh, oil shipments. Some of them were confiscated, some weren't. Um, uh, but um, they, they, and right now their strategy is not to give an inch before the Americans. Uh, their strategy is, you go first, you lift the sanctions first, and then we'll talk now. Uh, hopefully, Lincoln, the Secretary of State, is going to keep to his word and in his confirmation hearing and saying, no, they have to go first. But frankly, uh, you know, if, if I were in charge, and they wouldn't put me in charge, by the way, um, I, I wouldn't believe a word the Iranians said because they were lying through their teeth even during the JCPOA, uh, through their teeth. And the Israelis proved it when uh, Netanyahu unveiled all of the intelligence about three years ago. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have questions for questions. Oh, oh, oh let, me just, let me oh. just issue one thing. Mm -hmm. two, two, two advertisements. One is Sarah's group Emma, is great. You guys do a phenomenal job. So, so you should just donate everything you have in the world uh, to, to Sarah's group, okay? And, and if you wanna get our email, free email alerts on our articles on counterterrorism uh, against uh, Islamic, uh, ter uh, radical Islam, or what's going on in the intelligence community or what's going on in Israel, you can subscribe by just writing to uh, an email uh, it's a simple email. It's stop terror, one word, S T O P terror at AOL.com and say, please subscribe me. And then we'll subscribe you to our emails. Thank you, Steve. I, I can't thank you enough. Um, first of all, um, you are a great national treasure. You really are an American hero, and you're also a hero for the state of Israel. And um, I, you have devoted your entire life to this. And um, I, you know, want you to keep devoting many, many, many years to this, you know, at least, as we say, until 120. And I'm, um, I'm great. I'm, I'm really very grateful. I also want people to look at um, the investigative project for terrorism website and um, donate if you can, please, to that group. Steve has been invited to testify in Congress many, many times. He, you know, is always asked for his opinion. Um, and he is a national treasure. So um, thank you so, so much. And of course, you know, all everything costs us a great deal of money. So if you can support Ahmed, um, please go to our website at ahmedonline.org. But thank you so much, Steve, for your wisdom. And we could, we could at least have had you on for another hour. Uh, listen, I, I also want to thank Sarah and Buddy because they have been feeding me for at least 45 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. And um, uh, next week, um, we are going to um, have some experts who will be um, talking um, with us about the referral of um, the question of Israel and their behavior in the 2014 war to the International Criminal Court of Justice and The Hague and how inappropriate that referral is. And um, by the way, there is a law from 2015 that says if the Palestinians initiate a referral, we are not allowed to give them 
money. Um, I don't know whether or not there is a possibility with the Biden administration to stop the funding to the PA as, and, and also to stop the funding to the PA because of the Taylor Force Act, where they're giving about $350 million a year to their prisoners' pensions fund and their martyrs' fund. And that money is supposed to be deducted from the annual amount of money that we give to the PA. Um, but we're trying to work on that on Capitol Hill. And thank you so much for tuning in today. And we're looking forward to seeing most of you back again next week. Um, and again, thank you, Steve. <laughs>